beat myself up so much when my mom died. I mean, really, I, I just could not forgive myself. I said, you know what, why would I such a jerk? She, she loved me so much. I just know I'm sourcing the host of the Teenage Impact Podcast, where we share stories, tips, and strategies on how you as a teenage kid can overcome your daily struggles in life. If you haven't done so already, go, please click on the link in the description, the seven quick and easy ways to feel better about yourself. These are tips based off of my own experiences and based off of the 31 interviews I have done with people all around the world who are making an impact. It, these are life-changing tips that you can implement right now to feel good. If you're tuning in for the first time and you're tuning in from Apple Podcasts, please rate and review the Teenage Impact if you enjoyed this episode. Rate it five stars, review it, let everyone else know what you think. I'm trying to rank higher on the list so I can inspire more teens like yourself. Today's podcast guest is Mark Merrill. Mark Merrill is former WWE and WCW champion. He wrestled against one of the most famous wrestlers of all time, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Undertaker, Triple H, The Rock. I actually used to watch him when I was five, six, seven, eight years old. I remember him in his wrestling matches. People thought he had it all. He had the fame, he had the money, he traveled the world, but he was really suffering inside. He started hanging out with the wrong crowd, got addicted to drugs and alcohol, and even wanted to commit suicide at times. Forgiveness is a hard thing to others and to yourself. We beat ourselves over, over, and over again. So I want to give it up for Mark Merrill, who is now one of the top youth motivational speakers. He's spoken in, he speaks in two to 300 schools every single year. And he's going to talk about the power of forgiveness. So give it up for Mark Merrill. Thank you so much, Mark, for doing this. Uh, it's really a pleasure. I've, uh, I, you know, I've watched you wrestle when I was seven, eight years old. And just doing this interview, I'm truly grateful that you're here. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate you having me on your show. I'm looking forward to this. We've been, I've been reading about what you're doing, and I'm really, really proud to talk to you and uh, you know, tackle some of the issues, the relevant issues that, that many people are going through today. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And now, b before we go into you know, your wrestling career, your uh, career as a youth motivational speaker, let's tell us a little bit about your youth story and some of the challenges you faced. Well, you know, I grew up like many, many young people today in a single family home. My mom worked two jobs. We lived in, on the west side of Buffalo, New York. And at that time, it was one of the worst drug and gang infested neighborhoods in New York. And uh, it was a real dangerous place to live and grow up. And, and it, was, it, was, it was very difficult, especially being really poor and, and going through that. Uh, many of the issues that, that people are going through today, you know. So, and I think that's why I've had such a, uh, been able to relate to, to students. And they, they, they're so, they, they're captivating. They can relate to my story. You grew up. You grew up up north in a drug-infested uh, neighborhood. And when did you move to Florida? You you live in Florida right now, right? I, I do. I do. Um. I well. I went to high school. We moved out of Buffalo. Out of out of, out of uh, Buffalo to um, Syracuse. I went to high school in uh, mm -hmm. at Liverpool, New York, and that's where my life really started changing. Where I really got into sports and really excelled in sports. But, uh, getting out of Buffalo was the was the first thing to becoming successful in sports. And then I didn't move to Florida until later on in life, uh, not until I was about uh, 30 years old. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved with wrestling? Well, it's a, a <laughs> kind of a long story, but uh, I'll give you the short version. It really starts by having a dream, a goal. And when, ever since I was little, you know, I have this book that I wrote down when I was 10 years old that someday I'd be a professional athlete. And uh, what's so funny about this little book is I actually wrote down I was going rookie of the year because I loved hockey. And I remember there was a, a hockey player from Buffalo Sabres named Gilbert Perot, and he won Rookie of the Year. So I wrote down, I'm going to win Rookie of the Year someday, you know. And sure enough, who would ever think that? And in, in, in 1990, when I went Pro Wrestling Illustrated Rookie of the Year for, for wrestling. And, yeah. uh, but I wrote down these dreams and goals when I was a kid. And what happened was when I was uh, 30 years old, I, was with, I had a bunch of buddies over my apartment, and one of my friends was flipping to the TV channels, and he, he landed on professional wrestling. And I just, I remember just saying, oh, stop there. Let's, let's watch this. And as I'm watching it, I just got this overwhelming feeling. I call it the, the you know, you've heard of the aha moment where you just go, oh my gosh. And I said, I can do that. 
my buddies bust out laughing. They go, Mark, look at the size of those guys. I mean, someone like on TV was like the Road Warriors or something. <laughs> they go, those guys will pick you up over their head and throw you right out of that ring. I said, man, I'm telling you, I could do that. And one of my other buddies goes, Mark, you're 30 years old. What are you doing? Start a pro career now? And I, mean, I just remember seeing those two words go, you know what? I believe. And so I found out where there was a wrestling school. I was living, at that time, I was living in Venice, Florida. I, 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 I moved out there to, to build sw swimming pools. I worked for a company that, that dug swimming pools. So I, um, uh, there was a wrestling school in Tampa, Florida. It was a, a Boris Malenko. His sons were Joe and Dean Malenko. They were very popular wrestlers, great wrestlers. And uh, so Boris Malenko was the one that, that I went to his wrestling school. He taught me how to wrestle. And then I would uh, drive with a bunch of guys up to uh, Atlanta, about eight hour drive. And we would hopefully get picked for being on television as one of the enhancement guys or you know, job guys that get beat up on television for 150 bucks and drive eight hours home, you know? And sure enough, they picked me. My first match was a tag team match. Me and another guy wrestled Doom. <laughs> you remember Doom? Doom, I Ron don't Simmons Doom. and Butch Reed. Two of the biggest guys, meanest hombres out there, you know? You know, I kind of screwed up the match, you know, and I felt really bad. And I remember... Dusty Rhodes pulled me, asked me to, uh, I had to go to his office after, um, at, at center stage. He uh, said to me, he goes, hey, kid, anybody ever tell you you look like Little Richard? <laughs> said, Who's Little Richard? I thought he was talking about a wrestler. And he goes, you know, a wop bam a loo bam a wop bam boo And I, he goes, the singer. I said, no, nah, no one's ever told me that. He goes, I think I got a gimmick for you. And that's how the Johnny B. Dead persona started was from Dusty Rhodes. It all started with a dream, you know, you're 30 years old, you, you were hanging out with your friends, really, you want to be a pro athlete at 10 years old, but where was the, I know because I, I want to become an entrepreneur in middle school and I lost my dream in high school, try to really blend in with society, where was that dream lost in between fifth grade and 30 years old? Well, that's a great question. And I, I actually talk about that. My presentation was um, I became a top flight boxer. I, I was uh, one of the New York State Golden Gloves year after year. And then I was uh, I went to the USA boxing team in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And at that time, the, 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 in 1980, the, the Olympics were boycotted. In 81 was when I was up there. And I didn't want to wait three more years to try for the Olympics. So I decided to turn professional. And I had my first professional boxing match scheduled in, in New York. And two weeks before my fight, I had my nose shattered in an accident. So I needed reconstructive surgery. And at that time off, I remember the, the doctors telling me it'd be about almost a year before I could come back and start having full contact. And in that time off, man, I just started hanging out with the wrong people. I, was, I remember thinking to myself, my whole life, all I did was train football, hockey, you know, uh, boxing. That's so all I did was train, you know, never had time off. And I had, first time I had this time, I had, I couldn't train, you know, so I had this time off and I just wanted to go have fun. And I always thought I'd come back in a year and one year turned into two years, two years turned to four years and four years turned to 10 years of my life of drug addiction. And that's where my life really spun out of control. And it wasn't until I was 30 years old where that dream was rekindled by simply a belief inside myself. I was always a good athlete. Every sport I played, I, I excelled at. So this was no different where I go, I can do that. Not really re re realizing how difficult it really is to become a professional wrestler and, and do well at it. You know, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a hard transition for me, but I excelled at it and, um, you know, and I, I loved it. I mean, I did, did it on and off for 14 years. Wow, okay. So you got involved with drug addiction and that's what kind of – spun you out of control and you know you got out of the professional uh, professional athlete world until pro wrestling now what tips would you have for someone who is involved in maybe friends or a neighborhood where there's a lot of drugs and alcohol they want to get out of it but they don't seem to know how to take that leap well, first of all, you know, we, we become who we surround ourselves with. You know, I, I tell these students all the time, you know, your friends are like elevators. They're either going to take you up or they're going to take you down. You show me your friends, I'll, I'll show you your future. And we, we, like I said, we become who we surround ourselves with. And you really think about 
how the people that you're around, how do they treat other people? How do they treat their parents? How do they, you know, how do they respect for people? Are they kind to people? And I found that, you know, I found my happiness by helping people. My compassion, my empathy for other people was incredible. And there was no greater joy than helping another person. And that's what really turned my life around was I, I really, I love helping people. I love, yeah, I've been doing, I've been doing this 13 years and you know what it's like to get a letter from a kid that saw you 10, 12, 13 years ago that has now signed a record deal or a professional athlete or owns their own company or has a family and doing really well, got off drugs, stopped self-harming, was suicidal. I, I, it's just incredible to know the difference that we can make in someone else's life. We just put forth the effort. Most people just don't put forth the effort. And now I made it my life mission to just help as many people as I possibly can. It's beautiful, beautiful. Wow. You're in wrestling now and in your thirties. Talk about a lot about chasing that dream, you know, chasing the millions and chasing. And then all of a sudden uh, I saw one of your videos where you talk about now you live for moments. Well, I, I did the, the, what it is is I no longer live in time. I live in moments and uh -huh. I cherish every moment. It's not what's in your pocket that matters. It's it's what's in your heart that that truly matters. And and life passes so quickly. You know, I, I had millions of dollars at one time and and lost it all. And then and then re reinvented myself. And and the, the problem I see with many people is even though you know we we, we all you know every one of us you know we we. we just because you're having some, a bad day or, or bad years in your life, it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. When we realize that we're the author of our story and every day we can write a new page. And like I said, just because some people out there listening to this may have had some bad chapters just like me, it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. But the problem is so many times as adults, we become complacent in life. One day becomes the next and we settle for the status quo. We, we say things like those were the days. And, and, and when you believe that those were the days, you're basically saying your best days have already passed you. I want to believe that the rest of my life will be the best of my life. My, my best years are still ahead of me, you know. I certainly have fewer years left than I've already lived, you know. But I got to tell you, man, I, I get up every morning and, and, and I have a, an attitude is a choice. Happiness is a choice. I don't care what anyone says because it's not about our circumstance or our situation. It's how we respond to it that makes all the difference. And I found a whole new way to respond to adverse situations. Number one, I live in attitude of gratitude, man. I'm so grateful for, for the things in my life, my health. Do you know in 13 years, I've never missed an event? Never, never missed, never been sick. I, I, I cherish that. I mean, because people don't realize how important health is until you don't have it, until you're, you're very sick or you can't do something you love doing. You, you can't talk on the phone, you're so sick, you know? I, I just don't want to live like that. And I, and I, and I really believe it's a, it, it, part of it is a mindset. I, I got a really strong, strong conviction and my faith in God and, and the way I, I live my life. I, I really believe that it's really helped me realize that my best years are still ahead of me. It's, it's funny that you say that because, you know, you feel so young and nowadays you see people in their twenties, you know, they get to, they graduate college and says, oh, my life is over. You don't understand how many people, how many early, people in their early 20s say, oh, my life is over right now. Uh, because sad. Just graduated college. I'm 25. I just turned 30. Oh, my gosh. It's, and I used to kind of had, have that mentality when I, was, you know, when I was younger, when I graduated college, because I always, just like you, I was always – you know, rush to the finish line, rush, 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 rush. But what you said is powerful, gratitude. You, you strive to be better every single day, but you're grateful for the moments you have right now. Do you have any morning rituals that you practice to help you kickstart your day? Well, one of the things that I'm actually doing more of now, even, you know, and the funny thing is when you talk about that some people are, feel like their life is over at 20. I, I, in six months, I turned 60. You know, six zero. Looks so, phenomenal, man. <laughs> when I think about someone that's saying that at twenty, it's like, oh my gosh! You know, if I got if I got twenty years left on this planet, I'm gonna be blessed, man. You know, so I want to live every moment. Like I, I choose. Like today has been an amazing day. We've been so busy at the at the. I'm actually home in Orlando today, so I was at the office today. And we got so much going on there. With uh, we got some new tours coming up. To we're going to Canada. We're going to uh, next week. We're going to Texas. Then we go to Missouri. 
I'm so excited, you know, that, that I got so much to, to look forward to. And I, I will, I just, and it, my heart goes out to those people that are younger that feel like that's it, you know, or I, I don't have no reason to get up tomorrow. You, you got to find a reason to get up. Don't, don't just, you know, it's not the end of the story. Don't, don't feel like that. We, we actually convince ourselves that our, it's doom and gloom. And, and then we surround ourselves with people that also feel like that. Life sucks. I hate myself. I hate this. I hate that. Or I hate this person. Man, you know, I, I, one of the things that's really helped me too is, is having forgiveness in my heart. You know, sometimes we are, we're so bitter or resentful from somebody or hate somebody or whatever. And, and, and you, you, you got to have forgiveness because it actually releases you from a prison that you, you put yourself in an emotional prison. But let me tell you about forgiveness. And some of the, one of the hardest people to forgive is usually ourself. Stop beating yourself up over something that happened months or years ago that, you know, you're not going to change it by beating yourself up. Forgive yourself. You know, forgive yourself. You, okay, you made a mistake. Move on, you know. And, and maybe if you hurt other people along the way, maybe, maybe apologize to them and let them know, you know, I'm really sorry. I screwed up, man. And, you know, they may not accept your apology, but, it, hey, you, at least you tried. At least you know you, you've given you, your best, that you're, but you're going to change your own life. So. I had to forgive myself because I beat myself up for too long and I still make mistakes, man. Nobody's perfect, man. I got to tell you. And when, when someone tries to put me on a pedestal thinking that I'm this, this perfect guy, I ain't perfect, man. I make mistakes too. And, but I, but I, I, when I do make a mistake, I ask for forgiveness. I, I try to learn from that mistake where it doesn't become just another mistake. It comes to be, it becomes a learning experience in my life. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves, especially in high school and especially to get into colleges, the best college, you have extracurricular activities going on, you're doing sports, you have the pressure from your family, your friends, your teachers, all this made up pressure that you see on social media, that's how anxiety forms, because you have to be like a certain somebody. How do you take that pressure off of you? Well, you know, the sad part is it's we often put the pressure on ourselves. It's, 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 it's right here. We are putting so much pressure on ourselves. We're always comparing ourselves to other people. Man, you're not defined by other people. You're not defined by their opinions. You're not defined by what they did or, or are doing. You know, work on yourself. You know, we, we often spend so much time on things that don't matter. You know, like, like your, your, your iPhone. I don't know if you have a, a mobile phone. Everybody's got a mobile phone. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> you know, at the end of the week, it tells you you spent uh, three yeah. hours a day or four hours a day on social media or on the phone, you know? And I think to myself, if you put that much effort into building your career, you know, researching, going after your dreams and goals, you know, writing down things that you want to do, putting it somewhere where you have to see it, you know? You know, Harvard University did a 10-year study on students that write down their dreams and goals. Amazing thing about this, this Harvard study was that not only did most of the students in the study, dreams and goals become real, and this is over 10 years, their dreams and goals become a reality. But the amazing thing about that Harvard study, those students after 10 years were making 10, 10 times, times more money than the other Harvard graduates. Man, what do you got to lose? Write your dreams and goals into existence. Take action towards them and go after them. But don't spend your life worried about how many followers you got, how many likes you got, what they say about me. Man, if I, if I spent as much time, like every day I, I, I try to write something positive and stuff, and I can't read all everything that people write about me. If someone writes something negative or, or something like that, I mean, everybody's got an opinion, you know? But man, until you walked in my shoes and you lived my life, you, 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 don't, you, you know, it, man, we, if we spend as much time loving people as we do judging them, this world would be a better place. Uh, let's talk about your pro wrestling career just a little bit. Who who's your favorite couple of your favorite opponents? Oh my gosh! Well, one of well because we're such good friends. One of my favorites, obviously, is Diamond Dallas Page. Uh -huh. We wrestled I, that guy and I. We must have wrestled each other like two hundred times. Same same thing with uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin because oh, and, and Triple H because us three, Stone Cold myself and the Triple H, the three of us. We're in WCW together, and then we were both in WWE together. So not only do we wrestle each other hundreds of times in WCW, then we go to WWE and or WWF at the time and wrestle each other many, many times. You know, house shows every day, doing two hundred something shows a year. And so I wrestled those guys so many times and had some great matches with with um, uh, Stone Cold, with Triple H, and one of my other favorites is with Flying Brian. Brian Pillman and I had some really good matches too. 
How was wrestling The Rock? Oh my gosh, The Rock's <laughs> a good guy, man. You know, I mean, I'm I when I see all the success he's had, he's such a hard worker, and he just really studied the game man, and and just really learned and, and did great. But he he was a good person, you know. I, I always enjoyed traveling or being around The Rock, you know. And uh, when he when he first came to W W F, you know. Uh, you know, we're all a little nervous when you first get there and stuff. And, and we used to pray together before our matches, you know. So it was like, Lord, please help us. <laughs> you know, we were both pretty, you know, new there and stuff. But uh, he did great. And I'm really, really happy that I got to know him and, and see the success he's had today. That's good. And how did you get involved with speaking to the youth? Well, you know, it's it's amazing because um, I got a call after wrestling went and I really made some bad choices in life again and hit rock bottom and just my life spun out of control. I, I actually got a job. I had to get a job. Uh, I was a personal trainer at Gold's Gym. And, um, the one in Tampa? No, it was in um, uh, Orlando. Here Orlando, in Orlando. Okay. So, you know, people would come in. They're like, hey, Mark, what are you doing here, man? I go, well, I'm a personal trainer. <laughs> and they're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> but uh, so I, I did really good at it, though. Like my, my, my clients got really good results and I ended up, saved enough money to where I got my own gym and it was really cool. So, but, but then I got a call from Melbourne high school. The coach wanted me to come and speak to the football team. I thought, Oh, that'd be cool, man. You know, give him some insight because I was always loved sports. I played football. So I did that. And I, I just remember feeling so empowered by the difference I was making in their life or how much they were, they were engaged in my presentation or my, my, my talk. And then they must have told another school, another school called me, and they wanted me to come and speak to this, the whole school. And that was cool. And then it got more and more, and I started doing it more and more. And, and, uh, but I, I really didn't have the presentation I have like I do now. You know, I mean, obviously, when you do anything you, enough times, you get better at it. But there was a few where I was thinking to myself, what am I even doing out here? <laughs> you know, these kids are tough, man. But then when I really started just speaking from my heart, everything changed. And it's been an amazing journey now. And the video that went viral about my, me speaking about my mom, that was actually, I was, I was staying with Dallas Page in Atlanta. I was doing schools in Atlanta. And DDP has the DDPY, the yoga. And they have a whole film crew there and studios and everything, you know. So he said, hey, you mind if the guys come out and film your presentation? And I said, sure, because many of the schools give us film and, and video releases, picture releases, to, you know, for my presentations. And so they filmed this thing, my presentation. And a couple of days later, DDP calls me and goes, Hey bro, the guys put together this really cool video of you a highlight reel. Do you mind if we share it on YouTube? I said, sure, go ahead. And he shared it. And I don't know, like a week later, he calls me and goes, bro, <laughs> that video just did a hundred thousand views. I go hundred thousand. So I sent it to me. So he sends it to me. I put it up on my Facebook page or my Instagram and next thing you know, it's millions and millions and millions. You know, like some companies that shared it, this one called Greek Kangaroo, they got 113 million on theirs alone. Anyways, we added it up one day. It was over half a billion people saw this video. But not only that, that's when the phone really started ringing. I mean, I was, our first month that video came on, and we had 3,000 booking requests for me to go to schools all over the country, all over the world. We went to Russia and spoke at schools in Russia. We, we went to Guatemala a few months ago. We're, we're working on going on tour to, to um, the UK. We Hopefully that's going to come through. In Australia, we hope that's going to come through. Uh, but it's, there's just no greater joy. I, I've, I've really found, I guess if you'd say I found, you find your calling in life, you know. You know, they say when you, when you find your passion, you never have to work, you know. So I look at it as I've been unemployed for 13 years now. <laughs> so I love what I do, though. Yeah, I saw that video a few years ago. I remember that video clearly. What was one or two le powerful lessons your mom taught you? Well, the one thing my mom taught me, obviously, is, is you can make more money, but you can't make more time. All she ever wanted to do was talk to me. I never had time for her. She was just, you know, bored talking to my mom, you know, or didn't have time for her. And I never, I, I guess I, I didn't realize how much a mom or a parent can love a child. That we, we often don't think about what they go through, you know, that the loneliness that maybe a single mom or a single dad really has because they don't have a significant other in their life because they're a single parent. And that time we have with them is so precious. Maybe not for you, but for them. 
I think that's where I really, when I talk about I had to forgive myself, I beat myself up so much when my mom died. I mean, really, I, I just could not forgive myself. I said, you know, why, why would I such a jerk? She, she loved me so much. She's always at my sporting events cheering me on. And I, you know, after the game, I just blow by her and go with my friends or, and I just, and she never, you know, like you were like, like I'd cop an attitude to someone if they were treating me like that, you know, I'd be like, you know, screw you, you know, parents, they're not like that, man. They're, they're just, they love you so much unconditional, you know, so I really learned about love and, and how important that is. And, um, you know, that's something I, I just don't want to take for granted in my life now. It's truly powerful. And it's, it's sad to know that, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have, you know, great connection and um, interactions with their parents. What would you tell them? Well, you know, I also know that there's parents that have really messed up too, you know, that there's a reason why on the other end too, that maybe they're in prison or they're, they're a drug addict or, or they they don't care about their kids or, or, you know, we, we see those stories all the time. So not everybody has a loving parent. I was blessed to have two loving parents that really cared about me. So the thing I could say is that it's so important to reach out to people. You know, maybe you have a friend or family member you, you used to do everything together with now you, you had a falling out for some reason or another. You know, as I get older, one thing I learned is sometimes it doesn't matter who was right or wrong. You know, it's about perception. You know what? We all make mistakes. We all need forgiveness. Be careful who you let fall out of your life. So re- 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 repair broken relationships is what I, I really would say. If you can, try, at least try. At least try. At least try so, God forbid, life passes quickly, man. We never know if there's a tomorrow. There's no pro- Tomorrow is not promised to anybody. So reach out. At least you know you, you, you tried. Were you, were you ever suicidal? Uh, oh, yeah, man. I, I went through a real dark period of my life, the depression, the anxiety, the losing everything. You know, my, my mother and my little brother died two weeks apart, you know. My, my sister died at 21 from cancer. You know, my dad died while I was holding him in my arms in the hospital, died of lung cancer. He was looking right at me, you know. And I lost so many friends, so many times. Just this past year, 2019, I lost six close friends and family members that were just, just a tough year, you know? So, but that's, I'm not suicidal no more. I mean, this is going back, back in 2003 where I really wanted to end it all. I thank God every day I didn't make that decision. I, I never would have known all the beautiful things that would have come in life, you know? Just because, you know, I, I tell people, you know, just because you know, we all go through storms in life. Every one of us, man. Some storms you can just walk through. Some storms you got to run through. But man, there are storms that come in our lives that we have to hang on with everything we got. Don't let go and don't give up, man, because I promise you, <laughs> it's one thing I can actually promise people this. After every storm, man, the sun will eventually shine as we brighter than you could ever imagine. Don't ever give up. It's so true. <clears throat> so true. So if anyone's listening to this and they are on the verge of suicide, don't ever give up. Um, There's people out there that truly do love you. And it may seem like it's going to be the end of the world, but it's truly not. There's uh, Life is precious. Yes. And so are you, man. So are you. Don't, don't, don't give up. I mean, we, we, we know there's, there's got to be someone listening to this that's going through a really hard time. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, that's what, I think that the joy I, I have in my life is being in that, that dark place and being at rock bottom, being in a place where you don't think nobody loves you or nobody cares you or you're ever going to find someone that's going to care about you or be in love again. It, 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 that's a lie from the enemy. It's a lie in our head. And, 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 I, and I tell you something, just, just hang in there. And every day you walk a little more, you run a little more, you get yourself in a place where all of a sudden you meet someone and your life is forever changed. You know, I, I met some of the most incredible people in my life. I never would have even known them if I would have ended my life. I never would have known the joy I have to find my passion. How would I know my passion if I didn't hang in there? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this interview. Do you have any other last tips? Do you um, have the only say is, man, I'd love to hear from some of your listeners, man. They could find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Sure. You know, my name, Mark. Mark is with a C, M-A-R-C-M-E-R-O. You could just Google me. You'll find me on all the social medias. But I'd love to 
hear from you guys. And um, and once again, brother, I commend you for what you're doing, man. Keep keep it going. You know, I know I'm what your 31st interview or something like that. 31st. My goal is 51. Yeah. I'm compiling this into a book called Never Fight Alone. Oh uh, man, come it's, on, it's it's been a five and a half month journey. Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, 51 is just the just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, <laughs> you've been doing this for years, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on your show, and God bless you and your listeners. Not a problem. Interviewing Mark Merrill is a huge accomplishment for me, not only because I used to watch him on TV when I was younger, but also because he's one of the most genuine guys I've ever talked to. He really, really wants to help people and impact people's lives. People might, might have thought he had the most perfect life, but he himself says he was not perfect especially when his mom passed away when he was in Japan. He felt bad. He felt bad because all she wanted to do was know what's going on in his life. And he kind of shunned her. And he sometimes yelled at her and said mean things to her. And he felt bad. He did not forgive himself for the longest time. And that's a lot of times what we do in our life. In school, what we're going through our, re- our broken relationships, what we tell our parents, what happens in school, how we handle certain situations. How many times do we constantly beat ourselves over and over and over again? I know I constantly beat myself up. When I feel like something didn't work out, I beat myself up and tell myself I could, I could have worked harder. I could have done this. I could have done that. But Mark says that the hardest thing to do is forgive ourselves and forgive other people. But once we learn the art of forgiveness, there's this burden that is lifted from our shoulder and we can continue with life and actually make an impact on our surroundings. He wanted to commit suicide at one point, several times. And if he would have, he wouldn't have impacted thousands and thousands and millions of people's lives from his presence. He speaks at two, 300 schools a year People write notes to him saying that they want to commit suicide, but no longer do because of listening to him speak. Or someone becomes really successful 15 years later and says, hey, you made an impact on my life. So what I want you to take away from this interview is don't be so hard on yourself. The problems you're going through now is not forever. It's temporary. So cut yourself some slack and continue with this journey you call life, because one day you're going to know the meaning of life and you're going to be grateful that you never ended it. If you have a friend that's in the funk, share the Teenage Impact Podcast. I've interviewed 31 people so far who are making an impact, who talk about their struggles in life as a teenage kid and what you can do to overcome them as well. I want people to feel inspired. So share Teenage Impact Podcast. And until next time, peace.